Okay, a couple of things before uh, I will do roller carousels and roller coasters today. Um, first is, again, the, the first midterm exam is in class on Monday. Uh, the only thing you need to bring is a pencil. Uh, you can, in fact, use a pen. It's just obviously you can't erase. Um, you'll, be, you'll be filling out a bubble sheet. Uh, 30 multiple choice questions, very similar to previous exams, therefore I encourage you to take the old exams. If you see stuff about electricity on the exams, you've gone to the spring course website, wrong website, go back to, you want, you want the 1050 website. They look very similar. Okay, any questions about exam stuff? Uh, other than t content, I, I, it will cover Everything from day one until, including today, carousels and roller coasters, um, fairly superficially in roller coasters and carousels, because the key points are all like, most of what I care about in any of the sections. The specific topics I was asked a question about, will, will it cover the topics that I do in class or the topics I do on the problem sets? Well, they're all fair game because they all share the same physics. So, so, okay, we did this, the story of how an escalator works. Well, it's going to be very similar to the story of how a, a cable car works, carrying you up to the mountain or something like that. Um, apart from some of the details, it's the same physics. All right, I think, I think I've said everything I wanted about the exam. Oh, yeah, well, I, it's, it's related. My office hours on Monday are normally in the afternoon, 3 to 5, in Alderman Cafe. Since no one's going to come to them after the exam, you will, you know, right? I'll hold them in the morning, 9 to 11, in Alderman Cafe. So if you want, if you've got questions at the last minute, come look for me in Alderman Cafe. It's the entry level of Alderman Library, um, 9 to 11. Is that okay? And the same after class today, if you've got questions that are your, your burning questions, right, come on up, and, and if we get, we'll get chased out by the chemistry class. But, but we can go out in the hall and keep going. Okay, so I'll try to, to, to answer questions. Last, last thing is I left behind one of my favorite demonstrations. You talk about bouncing balls, an obvious one. And if I drop a, a, just a tennis ball, so here's the, here's the story, right? Drop a tennis ball, it bounces like that. It's off the, off the immo, you know, non-moving, essentially immovable surface of the floor. And the same with the basketball. Ah, come back here. Didn't bounce much at all. What if I stack them? And just to, to, to give you, a, it, since my goal is, is unmagic, I will try to explain a little before I do it. And that is, the tennis ball is effectively going to bounce off the basketball after the basketball has bounced. So the basketball will be moving up when the, when the tennis ball bounces off of it. So you, you can imagine how, what, what, what that's going to do to the tennis ball. So let's, this may take more than one version. We'll try it. Thanks. So the tennis ball went higher than anything in the story, right? We're starting at this height. You know, how did the, try it again. Woo, tennis ball, OK? It was, it, it's batted upward. The tennis ball is batted upward by a rising basketball. So it's, you know, impress your friends. It's a fun, fun thing. Uh, this works best when the ball on the bottom has a lot more mass and sort of dominates the impact than the ball on top. There are toys they sell, or used to sell, that had a stack of five balls. Ideally, they would vary in mass enormously so the bottom won't be like a bowling ball and work with. It, it, they, don't, they don't go that extreme, but it was a stack of five balls, and as far as I can tell, the, 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 the top ball is lost in space after the, after the first time you drop it, so it becomes a stack of four balls. It's like way too much. Uh, incidentally, the, the limit of how high that ball can go, the tennis ball can go, is, I think, yeah, I should have done this in advance. I, haven't thought, I think it's nine times as high as as you start from. If they're both infinitely bouncy. Uh, the top ball, in principle, and the masses are dramatically different. The ball should be able to go to nine times the original height. All right, just for, just for two. You got any questions about wh how, why that worked? Or, okay, yeah, Sam. Does the bottom ball bounce the same height? Does the bottom ball bounce the same height as it normally would? No, because as, it bounce, as the top ball bounces off of it, they exchange some momentum. And there's actually some work done. 
because it's a rising process. And so the bottom ball loses a little bit of energy and loses a bit of, of upward momentum. It does not go as high as it would have without that buddy on top. Okay? So energy is conserved and all that stuff. Yeah. Why doesn't the tennis ball bounce as soon as the basketball Why doesn't the tennis ball bounce as soon as the basketball hits? It's because the bounce takes a little bit of time. And the, the basketball and tennis ball actually are sort of bouncing at the same time. And the, the tennis ball finishes its bounce at about the same time the basketball finishes its bounce. So it's actually, it's, it, it's finishing its bounce off the rising basketball. You know, so I'm, I'm waving my hands a little bit about the real details. You have to sort of get in there close and watch the two compress. But it's effectively bouncing off the rising tennis ball, basketball. Is that okay? Uh, all right. So about carousels and roller coasters, and I, again, I apologize, I put the video up a couple hours ago. I just, I get behind. So I'm gonna try to make this a, 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 essentially a complete story anyway, uh, similar to the, to the lecture video. So you can see it twice if you want. And the idea is this, that, that up until now we've looked at, at acceleration. We, we, you know, my, under, my underlying theme here is we've looked at acceleration from the point of view of other stuff accelerating. So the skater accelerating when the other skater pushes on her and so on. Now let's be the accelerating object and see what it's like. What's the experience of acceleration? And it turns out you can feel accelerations and you've felt them all your life. You cannot feel your velocity. That is, if you close your eyes and you're moving at constant velocity, it just makes life simple. Your constant velocity, so there's no acceleration to, to interfere with the story. If you're moving at constant velocity, you close your eyes, you can't tell you're moving. In fact, you can convince yourself you're moving differently than you actually are, and you, you may well, if you're, if you're like me, <laughs> sorry. If, if, if you're like, anyway, if you're, like some, if you're sort of like me, um, you've done this where you're, you're riding along, ideally not the driver of the car, you close your eyes, you're in a train or something like that, and you convince yourself you're moving the other way. You, it's, it's sort of jiggling around a little bit, but maybe I'm facing backwards. Maybe I'm facing forwards. Same in an airplane. Anything where you're moving at constant velocity, you cannot feel your velocity. It's, and no instrument can figure it out either. Just by, just by looking locally, what's going on? What's going on? Am I moving? You can't tell. And, and it's, this is part of why inertia is what it is. It's, you, you, things coast. You can feel acceleration. And when you accelerate, you invariably feel a gravity-like experience in the direction opposite your acceleration. I call that experience the feeling of acceleration, just to give it a name, feeling of acceleration. It's not a force. It's just an experience due to your own inertia and your own body's tendency to, to, to or intent, want to not accelerate, to, to be inertial. And, and let, me, let me walk you through this a little bit, uh, the, the, way, the way I do in the book, the way I do in the video. And so here's the story for that. How do we experience weight? The way you experience weight, if you're just standing or you're sitting, and you feel, you feel your weight. What you're feeling really is the stresses in your body that are involved in not falling and keeping the parts of you from not falling. For example, I'm standing here on the ground and the, and the ground is pushing on my feet to support my weight. So the net force on me is zero. But my weight is distributed all through my body as bits and pieces. My finger has a weight, my nose has a weight, all this stuff. And yet the force that's supporting all these pieces is actually exerted at my feet. So my feet are responsible for supporting my ankles, which support my knees, which support, you know, all the way up to, to my head. There's a stack of supporting processes going on, and we feel that stress inside, the need for my neck to push on my head, and so on. And you know, this is where it's wearing. It's, you, know, you get to the point at the end of the day where you feel like, I just want to lie down and get, get rid of all that stress associated with just the sheer bearing of weight. All right? So that's how we feel weight. We feel it in terms of these stresses. And what about if we're accelerating? Different, different situation. Forget about gravity and weight for the minute. And I, we're going to be in a race I'm going to be in a race car here, right? This is, so this is a Ferrari. You know, way too much power under the hood. Um, and great traction and everything like that. And I stop, I'm stopped at a light. And the light turns green. I pound the accelerator. Or Tesla, the obvious choice these days. 
Tesla in what in ludicrous mode. <laughs> okay, what happens uh, if nothing pushed on me when they did this? The car would drive forward, would accelerate forward, and I would just be sitting here motionless as I was, inertial, you know, being inertial, and the car would leave me behind. But that doesn't happen, thank goodness. The car pushes me forward to make sure I keep up with it. Uh, I accelerate with it. But that acceleration is not, it's not exerted on all the little parts of me, all the little pieces of mass. My fingers got mass, my nose has got mass. All these parts need to have their own individual force on them to make them accelerate. And that's going to be the responsibility first of my back. The car is going to push on my back. My back is going to push on my middle. It's going to push on my arms and my elbows, work its way all the way to my, my finger. And get all the pieces of me accelerating to the right. And I'm going to feel whole lots of these little stresses of all the parts of me pushing the parts in front of them forward, the pieces of mass in, in front of them forward as we accelerate forward. So can you visualize that experience or sort of in your mind's eye, feel it? I hope you all get an opportunity to, to ride some crazy car that accelerates like that. Or, or there roll, there's some, there's some uh, gadgets at, at roller coasters, uh, amusement parks. The volcano at King's Dominion, I used to do this, where, where it's got a really powerful motors that propel it. There are probably lots of them now. I haven't been to King's Dominion for a while. But these really rapidly accelerating roller coasters, you, oh, you, just, you feel your whole body's inertia trying not to accelerate like that. And the experience that you're feeling when that acceleration is occurring is these stresses. And they sure feel like, like weight, but not weight from the earth pulling you straight down. It's like a weight opposite the acceleration. So if you're accelerating to the right, you feel this experience pulling you to the left. All right? Yeah, hopefully, you, you, can, you can bring this back up from your memory of, of many, many such experiences. And you can't really tell the difference between the feeling of weight, which is this downward pull that we identify from, from feeling the stresses in us. You can't distinguish that from the feeling of acceleration, which if I'm accelerating to the right is toward the left and involves all these stresses. They feel the same. So one of them is actually your weight acting, and that's straight down and we know the value. It's, you know, it's what, what the scale reports when you're standing motionless. The, the value of the feeling of acceleration it's, it's always in the direction opposite the acceleration. Simple as that. And the strength of that feeling, of that, you know, as, as compared to gravity, the, the, as, as compared to the, the experience of bearing your own weight, it is as strong as your weight if you're accelerating at 9.8 meters per second squared. So if you accelerate at the, at the same rate as falling, you experience a, a 1G feeling of acceleration, one gravity. So uh, cars rarely, most cars cannot accelerate at 1G because their tires won't grip the road enough. The, 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 sliding fric the static friction fails. But you can get high stick tires. Um, maybe once or twice in my life I've, I've been in a car that, that, that could handle this, that could accelerate at more than 1G. Um, and Drag racers certainly do, but they, make, they practically have adhesive tires. They're, they're almost gluing themselves to the road. Anyway, you can, as you accelerate forward at, at, at 9.8 meters per second squared, which is a ferocious acceleration, aircraft, yeah, barely, um, you get, you, you, it feels like your full weight pulling you in the opposite direction. And this has nothing to do with gravity yet at, at this moment. So we're OK with that? Today's lecture is on the exam, yes. So, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, 1G acceleration. Um, you experience both of these effects at once. You feel your own weight, and you simultaneously feel feelings of acceleration, assuming you are accelerating. And they, they, they're in, they, you can't tell them apart. You sort of lump them together into one quantity, which I call your apparent weight. Uh, it's, so it's the combination of, the, of real weight and this feeling of acceleration. It, they're vectors. They have directions to them. So you have to add them with the directions in mind, which is, a, OK, is nasty. But, but you can get a, the basic idea. 
And the, the, the most important cases or simple, or simple cases are if you're accelerating to the right uh, at a pretty good rate, uh, then you will simultaneously experience your actual weight downward and a feeling of acceleration to the left. And those two together become one overall experience that sure feels like, like weight, but it's, it's, co it's called apparent weight, and it's, it's down and back. It's the combination of these two effects together. Is that okay? Um, yeah. This, as, as just an aside, the fact, so, that, so that's one case, I would take an aside that, that some of the amusement park rides just seat you in a chair and show you a movie, and they tilt you funny back and forth and try to make you feel like you're accelerating. And they're using gravity to fake you out into thinking you're, you're accelerating. They tip you one way to, to make you feel like you're, you're, in, you're in a race car zooming forward. They're using your weight to, to pull backward on you as though you were in a, in a real car accelerating. Um, it's, it's a pretty poor, uh, it's not great, not very effective. Why? Because they have very limited uh, range of, of, of experiences to, to give you. They can't give you the experience of accelerating forward at three times the acceleration due to gravity, because that's a tremendous backward feeling of acceleration, and there's no way they can fake that without making you really accelerate. So they can only sort of make, give you a kind of a, a wimpy uh, facsimile. OK, so that's accelerating horizontally to the right. How about if you accelerate upward? And this would be, for example, if you get in a, a, a fast elevator, one that really goes from the first floor to the 87th floor quickly. When you first go in, you know, ding, you know, open, step in, 82nd floor, please. OK, during that, that initial upward acceleration, when you're going from motionless to heading up at some significant velocity, you're accelerating upward. And during that time, you experience a downward feeling of acceleration, which adds to your weight. You feel extra heavy. So hopefully you've had that experience. When you get to the top floor, or approach the top floor, they don't want you to keep going right through the penthouse, so they slow you down. So you accelerate downward then, which means you've got a feeling of acceleration upward, which adds to your downward weight, and it partly cancels it. You feel extra light. So hopefully you've had these experiences on, on fast elevators where you feel extra heavy as it starts up in the upward direction, and you feel extra light as it slows down in the upward direction. Okay? Um, extreme case that's worth paying attention to is what happens if they drop you? you know, go to a drop tower. Roller coasters come close to pulling this off, but drop towers actually do it. They, they for all practical purposes, let you fall, uh, obviously in a protected in, environment. And when that happens, you are accelerating downward at the acceleration due to gravity. 9.8 meters per second squared downward. So you feel, have an experience a feeling of acceleration upward. And how strong is it? Well, you're accelerating at just the right rate to feel a full 1G upward feeling of acceleration. It feels just like, like an extra gravity pulling you up. And that perfectly cancels your downward feeling of actual weight. The result is you feel nothing. You feel weightless. You're not actually weightless. You have your ordinary weight acting on you, just like always. It's you can't feel it. No, oh, no stresses. In fact, all, the, all your parts are falling together, like, like a whole bunch of little balls coming down together. And our bodies, or at least, you know, we're, we're, we're evolved to be ter you know, That's a terrifying feeling, that, uh, the visceral. Uh, it's not the fall that's the problem. It's the impact at the bottom. Obviously, the drop towers don't let you do that impact. But anyway, that's why you feel weightless when they drop you. Like when you jump off a, during bungee jumping in problem set three. All right? So that's, that's the feeling of acceleration, the feeling of actual weight. When, it, when we add them together to, to talk about their combined experience, I call that apparent weight. So it's the combination of real feeling of weight and feeling of acceleration. Um, the question coming in about my use of the word upward and uphill uh, in context of problem sets and, and exam questions. Upward is that direction, straight up. Uphill is along the surface. So that's my, that's my, uh, my those are my definitions. And I try to be consistent with them. 
Okay, so, so questions about the, the experience of acceleration. <coughs> Having said that then, so, so context in which you, get ex uh, you accelerate. The first one, the simplest, most uh, pedestrian, is a, a carousel, or equivalently a merry-go-round. I thought they'd entirely disappeared from uh, Charlottesville, but they're actually, I found a merry-go-round recently. I think it was at uh, yeah, Greenleaf Park, had a merry-go-round. Yay! Point is this, when you're on a carousel, let's put you back on a carousel, except the sa same physics as the merry-go-round. You're going around in a circle. In fact, sort of the middle of the ride, it's been going on for a while. Let's, let, you can be on a bouncing horse if you like, but let's, let's, let's get you off the, off the bouncing horse and just have you seated on one of the ones that doesn't move. I know it's more boring, but that's life. So you're, you're going around. You are not inertial. Your net, the net force on you is not zero, because, and you are accelerating. Why? Your speed is constant. So you're covering the same distance every fraction of a second. But your direction of travel is changing continuously. You know, this is my direction of travel. I'm pointing at it. It's, it's changing as I go around in the circle. So you're accelerating. That definitely counts. So anytime you're going around a curve or you're traveling in a circle, your, your, your path is bending, you are accelerating. And that just leaves us with the question, okay, so, so in which direction are you, tra are, are you accelerating? It turns out that if you're traveling at, at a constant speed in a real circle, you are accelerating exactly toward the center of that circle. If you're not in a perfect circle or not at perfectly uniform speed, you're accelerating roughly toward the center of the circle. And so this applies, for example, when you're driving uh, on the highway and you come into a left turn, an arcing left turn in the road. As you go around that left turn in the road in a car, a bicycle, whatever, whatever you're doing, or you're running around that turn on a, on a track, you are accelerating towards the, what I, what I call the inside of the turn. So if, if, if the turn is from, from this to this, the inside of the turn is here. That's, this, is the, this is the outside out here, this is the inside. So you're accelerating toward the inside of the turn, approximately. And that means you have an experience of acceleration out toward the outside of the turn. Is that okay? This should be consistent with your everyday experience. Just pay attention to it next time you go around a turn. At any, at any reasonable speed, it depends on how tight the turn is. If the turn is extremely slow and relaxed, you might not notice much. But if it's a tight turn, you'll feel it. Um, this leads to things like, actually, you have to lean as you go around a turn. Well, I'll, I'll talk about it in the context of bicycles. But if you try to stand exactly upright as you go around a turn, you're running a race, and you, and you, and you come to the turn and you try to stay upright, you tip over to the outside because your feet manage to make the turn. They get the, the, the force that, needs, that, that they need to bend, the, to bend their path. But your body goes inertial, and you're, you tip over as your body tries to continue in a straight line. That didn't make sense. We'll come back to it in bicycles. OK, so on a carousel, you feel a feeling of acceleration away from the center because you're accelerating toward the center. Is that okay? Uh, the faster the, the carousel goes, the, um, the, the diameter matters. Uh, the details, I'll leave them in the book. I don't really care about the, the, being able to calculate exactly what acceleration you experience. It's, you, you all know that the faster that disc turns, the, 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 the carousel or the merry-go-round, the, the more intense this outward feeling of acceleration becomes because your acceleration toward the center becomes more aggressive. All right? Um, so if this is you, th that ball is you. This ball is trying to go, just to give you an idea, again, why does, if that, that pink ball is you, why are you experiencing this outward feeling of acceleration? It's because something is pulling you toward the center. In this case, it's a string, and me. We're pulling you to the center. And without it, you would go straight, you know. I should have planned ahead for where the ball would go. Um, when I let go, at that instant, the ball went, stopped bending. Just, so just to illustrate that, let me, let me animate this. It's going around and around and around and around. If I let go right here, your gut 
we might say that it should suddenly head that way. But it doesn't. It heads in the direction it was heading, which is this way. Is that okay? You try. You'll, you know, it, it will do that. If I, if I were to plan ahead properly, I could do that. Actually, forget this, that. Let me try this. I have to always let it go a little bit beyond that point, because otherwise I'll hit jack here. Ready? Okay? Yay! Success, and I didn't hit him. All right. So that's carousel stuff. How about roller coasters? Well, two parts of roller coasters to pay attention to. The, 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 the first part is just the, that first hill when you, when you dive down. You know, tick -a tick -a tick -a tick 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 and then, whoo, down that. So you're, roll, you're accelerating down a ramp. Make it simple. Then they're always, they add complications, but it's basically you're accelerating down a ramp. And we know there's a ramp force acting on you and the car. And it's accelerating downhill because of that. And the acceleration is related to how steep the ramp is. If the ramp were perfectly vertical, you would accelerate it at the full acceleration of, due to gravity. If it's tilted at various other angles, it's a, it's a good fraction of the acceleration due to gravity. And it's always right downhill. So you experience an uphill feeling of acceleration in, in all of these cases. And that uphill feeling of acceleration uh, partially cancels your down, downward feeling of weight. So you feel lighter than normal and pulled in a little bit of a weird direction, because it's, it's, they're, they're, not, they're not exactly anti-parallel to each other. They're not, they're not along the same vertical line. So you feel, you feel a downward feeling of acceleration, an, uh, sorry, an upward feeling of acceleration, a downward weight, and when you add them together, you, that's kind of a wimpy feeling of weight it's at a cockeyed ankle. And you know this from experience, if you've ridden on a roller coaster, you feel, you feel this, again, this visceral, oh, I'm diving, I'm falling. Um, but you're not totally weightless. They don't, I, I don't know of any that are truly vertical. There was the hypersonic for a while at King's Dominion. I'm not sure that was full vertical or not. And then they, then they tore it down because I guess they, they, <laughs> too many people didn't like it or, 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 or sued or whatever. All right. So that's the, the, that's the, the dives. Uh, when you get to the bottom of a, of a, of a dive and you pull out, you're accelerating upward. If, I mean, imagine traveling in, in an arc like this. That's kind of like a circle or part of a circle, a piece of a circle. And again, you always are accelerating toward the inside of that arc, which is above you. So as you go through that bottom of the hill, you're accelerating upward, and you have a feeling of, experience, a feeling of acceleration downward, which adds to your weight, and you feel extra heavy. Right? And they're actually there. I should say there, there are limits that uh, amusement parks follow approximately. They don't want to make you get a feeling of acceleration that exceeds about four or five times the feeling of, of your actual weight. You know, four or five Gs is probably about all they'll, they'll do. They push the limits. But above that, you start to have problems like people black out. Um, their, blood no, their blood goes more inertial than it should, and it comes out of their heads and ends up in their feet, and they pass out. Uh, fighter pilots can go beyond six or seven Gs of, of acceleration and, and that, uh, but they have to wear special equipment and they have to be trained to tolerate the intense uh, feeling of acceleration and, and its effects on, the, on pieces of their body, which, which are always trying to go inertial, all right? That's, so that's roller coasters. I mean, there I can get into the details of the different cars actually do have different experiences. Uh, you want the ones that have the most intense downward, the cars that have the most intense downward accelerations, usually the ones that are most exciting. And the first car typically dangles for a long time, waiting for the final cars to pick up speed. And so it's usually the, the last car that gets whipped over that hill quickly. And in, in doing that, it's accelerating intensely downward and at a bit of an angle, and you get a really strong upward experience of acceleration, feeling of acceleration, and you feel especially weight, weight, uh, weightless. So my simple analysis is, if you want the best feeling in, in, in the car, you want the best visuals, sit in the front seat. You want the, the best experience riding in a roller coaster, go in the back seat. If you want the most boring choice, sit in the second seat. You get a great view of the people in front of you and, and not such a good uh, 
visceral experience. Okay? Loop the loops, and then I, then I can be done. The loop the loop is a lot like a vertical carousel. Uh, the difference is that because you're coasting through it, you're, go, you're rising and falling, and so your gravitational potential energy is, is, is changing as you, go up, as you go up and down. More gravitational potential energy and then less gravitational potential energy. That energy has to come from somewhere. It comes out of your kinetic energy. So you're traveling fastest at the bottom of the loop, loop slowest at the top, and so on. That makes life a little complicated. But more interesting, setting that aside, is the whole process of going around and my claim, which I'll justify in a minute, that when you're going at the top of the loop-the-loop -loop on a properly designed loop-the-loop -loop going fast enough, if you close your eyes, you can't tell when you're upside down. You feel still like you're pressed into, your, into the seat, like gravity, maybe a weak gravity is pulling you toward your, toward your seat, even though your seat in, in real space is above you and you feel pulled upward by this experience. Okay? If you've done loop loops, you might, might be able to remember this in your, in your mind, that as you go over the loop, you don't feel upside down. You might look upside down, but you don't feel it. Uh, if they make you go through the loop very slowly, which some of them do, they just take you through, typically a corkscrew or something like that, and they, they actually hang you upside down. In that case, yeah, you're quite aware that the ground is, the ground's below you, you're hanging upside down. Stuff is falling out of your pockets, your hat falls off, your eyeglasses, all that stuff. But when you go around a proper loop, loop full, at full speed, you, nothing comes out of your pockets. If you drop coins, they fall into the bottom of the, of the, of the they fall into the car, amazingly enough, even though that, that is above them. And so, I'll, so I'll try to give you an idea of why. Um, how, do I, how do I want to do this? If the, the ball by itself, if I just throw it, of course, it tries to go straight, apart from gravity. And gravity in, in, the, in this part of the story is going to be relatively unimportant. So if I just threw it straight and fast, it would go straight, right? Uh, uh, inertial. But if I bend its path with a string, I'm pulling it inward, I can make it travel in a circle. It's, it's this, I can, you can view this sort of as a battle between the ball wanting to go straight and the string saying, uh-uh, you're going to accelerate towards my hand. And so the ball, then, then its path bends. It's traveling at essentially constant speed, but its path is bending into a circle. OK? So this is the horizontal version, and therefore very similar to the carousel. But I can also go to a vertical, vertical version. Now, gravity is involved a bit. Whenever the ball is at the bottom, uh, I'm pulling up. Gravity is pulling down. So I actually have to pull extra hard to, to, to bend the path properly. When the ball is at the top, the string and the gravity are both pulling in the same direction. So gravity is helping me bend the path of, of the ball. But it's not enough all by itself. Gravity is not enough. The weight, of the, the weight of the ball is not strong enough to bend its path in this tight and fast a circle. If I let only gravity do this, let me try this. I let only gravity do the bend. It travels in a, in a much broader arc. So I'm tightening the arc. Gravity, yeah, it'll make a, it'll make a downward facing arc. But I'm, making, I'm causing it to bend even tighter than that. So the acceleration of the ball near the top of that arc is downward toward the center of the circle, approximately. And it's actually faster than the acceleration due to gravity. And um, I actually ha I had a, you know, do I want to do this? Yes, yeah, sure. Um, let me go to this question. If a ball is, is falling past you, so somebody dropped it from the, the, the high rise next door, and you, here comes the ball, can you reach out and push downward on that ball? You okay with the question? It's, yeah, it's up there. Oh boy, three whole votes so far, yeah, okay. I also have heard from, from some of you that the, the, the clicker app isn't so great. Sorry about that. Um, technology, so great. Teaching technology, woo! All right, uh, go another 10 seconds, let's see. How are we doing? Ooh, ooh, it's, it's yeah, here. There, he gives you good guidance, all right? 
Everybody is unsure. Well, half the people, at least, are unsure. You guys can fight it out. You can fight for E. You're fighting in the right direction, guys. Ooh, you listen to me. How about that? Amazing. All right. The answer is, yes, yeah, sure, you can, you can push on it. It will push back. Um, I'll stop this. OK. Back to live. If the ball, whatever the ball is doing, moving, moving, accelerating, whatever, I just have to push on it, and it pushes back. So yes, you can, it can be falling by. Yeah, I can push on it. And when I pushed on it, it accelerated downward faster than falling. Falling, that's an acceleration 9.8 meters per second squared. That is an acceleration, I don't know, 40 meters per second squared, something crazy. So there's no problem pushing something down or pulling it down, even though it's falling. And that's what's happening here. So this is falling, and this is falling if I just throw it, right? But if I whip it around in a circle, it's accelerating downward there faster than falling. You OK with that idea? And so pulling it inward from a, with a string is a little less convincing than pushing it inward with my hand. So there's a book. This is a book from graduate school that was, has, I've always used for this demo because I'm compulsive, I guess. If I go very sl slowly in a circle, it's going to fall, of course. But if I go fast enough in, 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 a, in a circle that involves such an intense downward acceleration that gravity alone can't do it, I have to push. Okay? So I'm pushing it down the whole way around. And it pushes back. So my hand and the book, we've, we're pressed against each other. So this could be the car, and this could be the track. And they push against each other the whole way around the trip. OK, where are you? All right, this is the, this is the money shot or whatever. Yeah, this is, it's pretty sad that it, it, phony wine's bad enough. Now we've got phony grape juice so that we don't violate alcohol policy. Heaven forbid I would have fake alcohol here. OK. The trick in this is not doing it. It's starting and stopping. So that's, this is the track. It's going to go around in a circle. This is the car, and that's you. All right. I got to concentrate a little bit. All right. See, continuing is OK as long as I pay attention. It's the stopping that works. All right. Yay! <laughs> One year, I did that, and then I stopped. I was so, so satisfied. And having done it, I showed everybody the, the stop in slow motion. No, 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 no. I, you got to let it coast up and then fall back. You're trying to, trying to let everything basically move as, it, as, as inertia and, and maybe gravity. Don't just tip the, the plate at slow mode, you know, slow it. Yeah, I broke the glass. OK, so, so that on a loop the loop, as you go around, you're accelerating downward faster than the acceleration due to gravity. You need the car to push you down. Therefore, you feel pressed into your seat, even though it's above you in space. And you experience a feeling of acceleration that's upward and that is stronger than the acceleration, stronger than your actual experience of weight. So you feel an upward apparent weight. You feel as though you're pulled toward the sky by something that's gravity-like. OK? What else? Um, last thing to, with this, to, just to show you, the lights are such a pain in this. Um, those of you who are in architecture, engineering matters. Uh, I know it's not necessarily much fun, but, but uh, if I could get the lights off the screen, the people who designed this refuse to do that. Let me, well, I mean, I'll do this, and I'll come, then I'll show, I'll show aux. Ah, oh, cam. Cam, where is it? Camera. Preset one. There, now you, you can see this, OK? I can't see it, but you can see it, OK? I'm in the dark. To, to, to have this effect where you are, where the ball is going to go around this loop, 
The ball needs the track to push it down. The ball has to accelerate downward ferociously. It has to be traveling pretty fast around a tight circle to accelerate like that. So if I start way up here, no problem. It, it, goes, it goes through the loop the loop. Okay? The track is essential to bend the path downward to make it travel in that tight circle. If we slow the ball down by, by giving it less kinetic energy, by starting, and starting with less gravitational potential, and right here, I think, is the, is the threshold, it'll make the first trip. But it won't make the return. Okay? You, you don't want to do that in a roller coaster. The problem was, now I'll stop and come back. Whoosh, 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 whoosh. The, the problem, once you go too slow, first of all, gravity becomes enough to bend your path in, in, in the, along, so, it, so you follow the track. And then eventually, gravity becomes too strong, and you bend, it bends your path more tightly than the track, and you leave the track surface. Um, obviously, they don't do that in a real roller coaster. They do send you around loops sometimes like that, but they, but they grip the track with the, with the car, and they grip you with all sorts of stuff around your body so that you can be hung upside down. Uh, but they, in most of the roller coasters, when they, when they send you down that, that incline to get you going before going through a loop-the-loop, -loop, it's got to be high enough. They've got to give you, start you with enough uh, gravitational potential energy that when it becomes kinetic energy, you go around that loop fast enough and you accelerate more intensely enough to, to stay pressed against the, tra the track in the car. Um, the reason that, that that ball didn't complete the second trip is it's wasting energy, it's thermal energy, throughout its trip. You can hear it roaring along, rubbing for whatever reason. And it, so it, it loses energy and eventually settles. It's settled down there at the bottom. But it needed a lot of energy to, to make it around that loop without coming free of the track. Um, any, let me look at this. What forces act, act on you when you ride a carousel? As you're going around the carousel, you're accelerating toward the center, after all, right? So whatever you're standing on or sitting on, or you're on a horse, whatever, it is exerting the force necessary to support your weight. So that's an upward part of its push. But it's also pushing you toward the center. Without that push toward the center, you would go straight, and you will leave the carousel. So if you take a merry-go-round, um, and you, when you start spinning it faster and faster, you, you, if you've ever done this as a kid, you know you've got to grab onto stuff because you need an intense force toward the center to bend your path in that tight circle. And if, <clears throat> if you run out of force, you're going to go right off the merry-go-round. Several years ago, somebody gave me a link to a video. This is, this is so long ago that it was like maybe before YouTube. Anyway, they had two kids on a merry-go-round and somebody with a moped spinning up to the merry-go-round with a rear wheel. And you see the kids going faster and faster and faster. Then, in a single frame, the kids disappear from view. I never, I don't want to know what happened. But I think they didn't have enough uh, inward force to bend their path anymore, and they went straight. All right? All right, I said it. Other questions? Yeah, Tori. When, when, we, when we accelerate inward toward the center of the merry-go-round, we feel pulled by sort of a gravity-like experience outward. It is not a real force. There's nothing pulling you outward. It's just your body's inertia trying to make you go straight. Okay? And actually, I had th this other question I can ask you guys. I know it's at the very last minute here. You're a passenger in a car that is turning left and you find yourself thrown against the door to your right, is there a force pushing you toward the door? You okay with the question? I think this, is, this will have payoff on Monday for those of you who are still here on a Friday afternoon, middle of the weekend. Five. Four, three, two, one. Be it is. There is no force pushing you toward the door. Instead, what you're, what you're feeling 
is your body's inertia trying to make you go straight. So the car is trying to, you know, the car's potentially driving out from under you to the left. You're sort of staying still, and the car's door has to come along and push you to bend your path to stay with the car. So you are genuinely being pushed by the door. It's pushing you toward the center of the, the inside of the turn. And as with Newton's third law, you have to push back. So you're genuinely pushing against the door. You feel flung somehow toward that right door, but there's no force pulling you toward the right door. It's, it's actually the opposite. It's the door is pushing you away. Yeah. What's the difference between inertia and momentum? Momentum is actually the deeper concept. The fact that when you're moving along and not interacting with anything, your momentum can't change. So because your mass can't change either, your velocity can't change. Momentum is the product of your mass times your velocity. You can't change your mass. So if your momentum isn't going to change, your velocity isn't going to change. You're going to keep doing what you're doing. So in the absence of forces, because momentum is conserved, the absence of force is your velocity is constant. That's where inertia showed up from. So inertia actually derives from the conservation of momentum. Is that okay? So I often will say that you have inertia and you have, you, you got, you got so much inertia. It's your, it's your inability to change your momentum without something giving you some new momentum. So in that, in, using that language, when you're going around the turn, your momentum is, is straight. And the turn, the car is going to leave you. So what does the car do? It has to give you some momentum toward the inside of the turn so that you don't go straight. It's, it's transferring momentum to you to, to make sure that you follow, accelerate with the car. Is that OK? I mean, it's a, it's a good question, and it sort of brings up, I mean, I hope you can follow that, that idea that, that lots of concepts in physics are related to other concepts or, or sort of essentially derive from them. They're simplified versions, or there are consequences of other concepts. So the conservation of momentum has all this influence on, on things that happen around us. And we can talk about it as inertia is one of the consequences of this idea of inertia. Objects at rest stay at rest. Objects in motion stay, tend to stay in motion. That's because momentum is hard to change. Is that OK? With that, then, have a good rest of the weekend, and uh, see you on Monday. And again, I got all, I'll have office hours Monday morning. <laughs>